this thing. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm going to share my screen just so we can get through a couple of our uh, vendors. Um, so this is the March general membership meeting, State of Real Estate New York. Uh, we have quite a few people on and our guest panel uh, from Under One Roof and Under One Roof Rochester, as well as some investors and property owners that are local to this particular market uh, who we're going to be talking tonight. Uh, so thanks everybody for taking the time out to be here. Uh, Freedom First RIA is a 501c6 nonprofit uh, dedicated to all those things on the screen. I'm not going to read it. Here's the disclaimer. Um, consult your legal and financial counsel before doing anything that's talked about tonight. And here is the agenda. Uh, we're gonna get to our member mem vendor members here in just a moment. And uh, then we're gonna let Leon take it and kind of kick it off and intro the panel. So I think I saw, we support under one roof. I saw Dave Knapp on. Uh, so if Dave can get himself ready to talk for a minute. We're a local chapter of National RIA. You get all kinds of cool benefits and perks through them by joining us. And we are now qualifying these meetings towards continuing education hours for your professional housing provider designation from the National RIA. So Dave, are you here? I'm here, Andy. Good evening. Excellent. Good evening, sir. Let's talk about this right here. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes. We have a, a Glidden product on sale at Home Depot, uh, and it's on sale until May 2nd. It's our five-gallon bucket of PVA primer, which is the primer you want to use if you have brand-new sheetrock or you've patched up some sheetrock, so you've got some spackle or drywall mud. You want a nice, even finish. It shows the color evenly and your sheen evenly, and this primer will seal that sheetrock or that patching material to give you a nice, even, clean finish. $35.98 at Home Depot, it's $4 off, but uh, everybody here, I hope, is a FRIA member. As a member of FRIA, you get 20% off, so that'll get it down to $28.78 a bucket for you. So until May 2nd, it's uh, a little over $10 off the regular price for that. Just have to remember, make sure you put the Pro Extra number in when you check out. Make sure that your Home Depot Pro Extra account knows that you are a member of FRIA. So that you do get a discount. If you have any trouble with that, next time you're in a Home Depot, go to the Pro Desk and they can uh, go into your profile and make sure that you have all the correct information there so you get a discount. So $10 off on a five gallon bucket of the, the drywall primer through May 2nd. Thank awesome. you, Andy. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it, brother. And he's not here, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, and introducing our speakers will be president of Freedom First RIA, everybody's friend, Leon Griggs. You're muted, sir. Unmute yourself, Leon. Let me there unmute myself. Okay. There you go. So, um, first of all, thanks for Jamie and Debbie being here tonight to uh, give us this uh, presentation that everyone is waiting with bated breath for associated with all those things going on in the uh, world of real estate investors, particularly those who uh, decide they, they want to have uh, tenants. And um, clearly that's a challenge. And this group of folks are, well, just waiting to see if we get any relief, of course. And, um, you know, Jamie has her meetings uh, uh, that from, at, at one point, they were every day, but, uh, you know, clearly um, uh, we've moved a little bit away from that. We'll let um, Debbie and Jamie go through uh, some of the things that we've seen over the past uh, year plus. Um, we could almost say two years, we go to, into the June, July type time frame and uh, also what it is that we're going to be trying to get accomplished to change things. Had a little bit of discussion 
about that before the meeting formally started um, and just um, sort of a path forward. So I think most people, and you can see with the um, slide that's up, um, Jamie, a partner with Bowling Code, and also Debbie Pastore, which is Pastorer, which is um, a person that I have come to um, to know and meet over the last past year. Very dynamic uh, individual, and uh, as a president of, of NICRA, uh, really have enjoyed meeting her and, um, and uh, coming to know her. Met Jamie quite a ways back, and um, I think that we are really fortunate to have these two individuals helping us to um, uh, do those things that are necessary to understand both the uh, tenants and the landlord side of things. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna do now is um, sort of give the intro back. Uh, certainly um, I can go through the piece associated with the New York, um, <clears throat> Rochester, New York owners and investors um, with uh, Kayla Fleesick and Jacob uh, Throp and also Richard uh, Tyson. Um, have seen uh, a couple of them on uh, various different um, webinars or Zoom meetings, um, but haven't been fortunate enough to meet them in first person. Look forward to hearing uh, what it is that they're gonna be uh, talking about, particularly from an under one roof perspective and uh, some of the things that we'll be doing going forward. So without further ado and taking up uh, more time, I'm gonna pass it back to uh, my friend, Andy McQuaid, who's gonna take us through the next steps of uh, our presentations and uh, things for this evening. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Leon. Um, so the next thing up that we have is we're just going to start and we're going to let our panelists take it from here, uh, starting with Jamie and Deb. And uh, after bringing us up to date on the current events that Jamie is chomping at the bit to, uh, to let us know about, we'll get into the panel discussion and open up the floor for questions and discussions after that. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Deb, I'm glad to see you unmuted yourself. So we're, we're probably just going to end up doing this in tandem. So just talk with me. Um, don't let me do this myself, please. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Jamie Michelle Keen. Uh, I'm a real estate partner in the local Rochester firm of Boiling Code. Um, previous to that, I was at Woodsovia and I have for the last decade spent my career in multifamily. Um, it's people like all of you um, and most definitely Deb that make me have the passion that I have for this industry. Um, I have hung out with Deb in some of her Red X buildings and watched how hard she works on a daily basis, fielding phone calls and, and catering to her tenants and just really being there. Um, and so, you know, part of the mission in why I got involved was to de demystify this stigma that you all get of being horrible people and slumlords and greedy landlords. And, you know, if, at the end of the day, my goal is to move that dial, um, kind of peel back the onion and show that you guys are actually real people, first of all. Um, you're not huge corporations owning buildings and that the sweat and equity truly comes from your own hands. And, you know, I've witnessed that and that's kind of what drives me to do this for you. I don't own any real property. People ask me that all the time. I'm not an investor. Um, I, I'm just an advisor and probably one of your biggest champions. So that is why I do what I do. Um, but Deb and I quickly realized last, probably I would say you know, April, that we were under attack and we were going, and actually, I should say this, two, two Aprils ago now, 2019, um, we were going to be under attack. Um, and it was necessary for NICRA to do something. Um, Deb is our, our leader. And, and again, Deb, jump in anytime here. Um, we just recognized that we couldn't um, advocate and be the arm for the National Apartment Association without a legislative wing. And so um, we immediately went into action to hire a lobbyist on behalf of this group. Um, I will... 
I will let Deb introduce herself. I'm just going to stop with, but for, and this is a lawyer thing, but for the HSTPA, COVID would not be that big of a problem. Um, so I want to make sure that we circle back to, to definitely put you in a situation where even though right now COVID is the biggest thing and getting you through this, because most of your properties and your businesses hinge on making it through. And we're, we're right there on that line of, can we make it through, to be honest? Um, this is a short-term, hopefully, problem. Um, the larger impacts of the HSTPA and the aftermath of COVID are really what our problems are going to be. And I dare say this not to be dramatic, but I foresee us being in, you know, this may have been two battles of a much larger war. And um, collectively, if anything tonight, you guys take away from what we're saying to you is if you're not part of this group yet, or if the five people you know in the industry who didn't make it to tonight's meeting aren't involved yet, the worst thing that could happen is that the landlords stay silent. Um, it is far too long that, that this group has, because you're hardworking, been silent and not active. And for every one of you who participate, there's 200 tenants on a bus. So I'm just gonna leave it with that and let Deb introduce herself for a second. Hey everybody, good evening. And thank you very much for having us. Uh, thank you, Leon. Thank you, Andy, for putting this together. My name is Debbie Pusatier, for those of you that don't know me. I uh, got into real estate because of a life change, kind of thrown into a two family situation from a a divorce and a single family homeowner to a, a renter and then decided I didn't want to rent. So I started buying property and part of it was just to survive. Also had a full-time job. And then as my life became more interesting with property, I realized I couldn't do both. I couldn't work full-time and take care of the buildings that I was acquiring because I enjoyed what I was doing. So ultimately I became a full-time real estate investor I have about 68 working units and about 25, as Jamie called them, Red X units that are trying to get back online, but COVID is putting a little damper on my finances for that, but that's okay. It'll, it'll work out. Uh, I'm also the president of the New York Capital Region Apartment Association, which is our local association throughout uh, parts of New York State. And we are affiliated with the National Apartment Association. So as Jamie said, in 2019, when we got wind of this HSTPA that was going to pass, we, we kind of got a call maybe a week before. And then they're like, well, it's not going to happen. And then the night before they, we got a call, it's happening and they're voting on it. And it happened. So with that, we realized we needed to put on a different hat, come to the aid of the industry, because as far as I knew, there wasn't an organized effort across the entire state to bring landlords and people related to the landlord industry together as a voice. The reason we chose to do that was because as we, at in the 11th hour, talked to some lobbyists and lawmakers, they kept saying, where have you been? We only hear from the tenants. We don't hear from you. Where, where are all the landlords? We hear about from this landlord and that landlord, but we don't hear from one solid group of landlords. So you must not really care too much. So anyway, Under One Roof was born. We fought after the HSTPA went into existence to try to modify it. I do think we made some headway and then COVID hit. So that morphed into, and I must give Jamie the kudos because she used her, the people in her firm and her time and resources to put together a daily workshop, briefing, guidance. And I want to say bitch session, excuse my French, for those of us that were like, oh my God, what's going on? And we all thought the first three months were just going to be it. And then it turned into dump on the landlord. We need to support the tenants. Uh, there's no bad tenants. Nobody is stealing from us. And that we got frustrated, went to our lobbyists, tried to talk to lawmakers. They, they seem to think that we're skewed in what we're seeing. However, 
some of the lawmakers I think are listening to us, but unfortunately they're in the minority. So we continue this battle for everybody. Uh, the other battle we fight for is the $60 million that's still sitting. Maybe Cuomo's using as a legal fund. I just made a joke. Uh, who knows? But um, we don't know where it is. It was supposed to be doled out to tenants in need, that the tenants would get to the landlords in need. And the criteria that the lawmakers put together to dole out all this money fell short of helping a lot of people. I believe 40 million, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, went out the door mainly to downstate people. Okay. And then the 60 million still sitting there because the tenants didn't qualify, which is interesting because I own primarily in low to middle income neighborhoods. I got one check for $1,400 and that tenant, her rent was 900 a month and she was already eight months delinquent. Uh, so I'm not clear how they did their their math on that, but they're still sitting on that money. And we've been after our lobbyists and the lawmakers, you know, and we're getting this. Well, I don't know, ask him, ask her. So we're keeping the fire hot on that because that's money that should be going to the landlords like us that are footing the bill for people. Uh, the other thing that concerns us is now the new money coming out. You know that our president signed the bill today, right? For all that money that I believe the people are getting 6% of all that money. Don't get me going on that. That's another tangent I could go on. However, they're trying to figure out how to divvy up the money allocated to New York State to help the tenants and thus help the landlords. So we've been fighting very hard to make sure that these lawmakers understand that our tenants aren't gonna go and apply. Most of them aren't. We also try to make them understand like me, how many tenants have walked away. And it's interesting how they can have enough money to go get another apartment, but they can't pay me the rent that they owe. So I've been left holding the bag for quite a lot of money from last year. And this continues. So we tried to make uh, the lawmakers see that it's not just the tenants in need, it's the landlord. And you have to consider not just the current tenant, but the tenants that up and left because we're not gonna get that money back. And so, that money was supposed to be used to pay the taxes, the water and sewer, so many other bills that the municipalities keep giving to us that I'm not clear where they think we're supposed to get the funds from because our funds come from our rent. So we've been fighting for that. In the meantime, we've been hearing also that good cause eviction is trying to come through the back door. The state was not able to pass it right before COVID, but that's on their agenda. So it's rearing its ugly head again on a state level. I'm, I'm in the Albany area and I know that our fabulous mayor has a Black Lives Matter uh, com competitor running for mayor. So now she's trying to push good cause eviction through. We've had meetings. It doesn't sound like we're gonna win this battle but it sounds like they're gonna be going through on in the city level. I know Rochester is also pushing for that. And I think what they're hoping for is that if enough cities voted in, it's kind of like a fire. It's gonna catch and New York State won't have to bother passing it because every city will have it. So we're fighting that battle. We haven't lost sight of the HSDPA, uh, which we're still trying to get that amended to make it a fair fight. You know, we all know there's good landlords, there's bad landlords. We all know there's good tenants and bad tenants. It's got to be a fair playing field. There's right and there's wrong. So we continue to fight. The other thing I want to say before I, I'll stop talking is that there are a few different lawsuits going on in the state. Jamie and I have discussed this feverishly, probably me more than, than her. She's had to bring me off that ledge uh, because I, I get so exasperated when people don't seem to connect the dots where this is my only income. And I have to find money to pay my bills. So if I can't pay my bills, I'm in trouble. And, and I'll share with you, I, I have amazing credit. I don't, I'm not, my debt to income ratio is pretty good. I applied for a mortgage on a building that I own free and clear last week. And I got turned down. I got turned down because they looked at my COVID numbers of the rents that I lost and my HSTPA numbers. And they said, nope. 
you don't qualify. So where do where does someone like us, where do we go from there? We can't leverage the property we have because we don't have the income that the property should be sustaining. So where do we go? I've already home equity lined a credit on my house. Why should I have to take out a second mortgage, put myself in debt to support someone that I know is working? Out of all my tenants that aren't paying, I only have two right now really COVID affected. And that that's that's a shame. But we are we are working now toward a lawsuit. Well, I shouldn't say we. We are supporting a lawsuit. I know it's kind of, it's a fine line because Jamie and I, it's our responsibility as the coalition leaders for Under One Roof to get you folks every single dime we can. If, if we're gonna be first in line there with our handout saying to these lawmakers, give us rent, take care of the rent that was gone, take care of our losses, help us, and don't let it all go to downstate, upstate. You know, we, we need help here. So we really soul searched about putting our name and our faces on a lawsuit that the lawmakers would look at us and say, you want us to give you money and you're suing New York state. So we have a couple landlords that we are vetting, talking to. We do have a landlord, uh, I'm sorry, a lawsuit moving. And I, it's, it's going to, I believe it's going to take life. I know RSA started a lawsuit downstate and I believe there's another lawsuit brewing in Western New York. So the goal is to have these three lawsuits going on simultaneously, put pressure on New York. You know what, folks? I'm sure we're going to lose. But in my mind, that's not the point of the lawsuit. The point of the lawsuit is no one's listening to us. No one's hearing us. No one seems to care. So there's got to be a way to bring this out in the open. So if we can get these lawsuits going, get them out in the public, get shot down, we've had an offer from uh, the group in New York City that we would then all combine forces, file an appeal, and they would um, hopefully carry the financial burden. So, you know, I know that we will win in the end. I know justice is coming. I know, I know. It's a tough, tough road to hoe right now. I know it's unfair. Trust me. Again, Jamie talks me off the ledge. I will go left really quickly. And then I'll tell you, God and I have had more conversations in the last year than I think we've had in my lifetime because it's very stressful and it's scary. You know, I have crew, a crew that depends on me, me feeding them. I have to pay them so they can feed their family. And when you have people depending on you, like I know most of you do, and you have to be responsible, uh, it's, it, gets, it takes a toll on you. So we are fighting for you. And I, I do believe that between pushing the legislature and pushing the lawsuits, I do believe that at least we're gonna get the exposure we need so that maybe somebody out there catches on and starts a conversation. So to piggyback off of that, to let you guys know kind of, um, it's very hard, I will tell you as a lobbyist to tell you everything in real time or tell you the detail because if we tell you something and it leaks, um, they won't talk to us anymore. So some of what we say has to be very guarded and you know, if, if it's coming from a source and it's not yet a done deal, everything's a deal in Albany, um, then you know, we have to be very careful of that because we don't ever wanna become the enemy. Um, real estate groups in the state of New York while collectively it appears everybody's working together, um, Deb and I have learned very hard lessons also that we are competitors. And so we are fighting against each other. Um, we might all have the same end goal, but we don't have the same ways of getting to that goal. And we also don't have equal chances at the goal, if that makes sense to you guys. So um, proprietary groupings, and for us, that means upstate, um, we have very different goals in New York City. So I will just let you know, I mean, there, I know that there are groups that people talk to downstate, and that's fine. I, I welcome all people on my round table, and I don't really mind. Um, when it comes to lobbying, we are not lobbying for the state of New York in its entirety. I want everybody to understand that. We are very regionalized from, I would say, the Hudson Valley up through Buffalo in the North Country. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that that is the territory that we're representing. 
because today, and I'm just going to give you a, a very overview umbrella. Um, I will tell you as much as I can right now without giving out things that could get me in trouble. But um, this morning, there, there is something called, um, well, let's put it this way. The budget has to be passed April 1. There are bills that go into the budget ahead of time that are voted on. Um, they are called one-way bills that come out of the Senate or the Assembly. Um, there are two-way bills that are mutually agreed upon. And now we have a governor who is basically at the mercy of the houses because they have supermajority veto power over him. So if there is a one-way bill coming out of the assembly and everybody has voted on it, it's pretty much gospel. Uh, same thing out of the Senate. If we have a two-way bill, it's all but done. So this morning we were alerted that the Kavanaugh bill, which is the bill that will disseminate the money from the federal government, that $1.3 billion. Um, the question with that is, you know, regionalization of funds. Um, one of the things, and I think I caught Rich, you saying it in the beginning of when, when I signed on, one of the main concerns has been that tenants did not engage in the $100 million rent relief fund. So tenants were not applying, it was very cumbersome, they didn't have access, they were lazy, they didn't care about their landlord, they didn't want to help. Whatever the reason was, could have been also that they vacated the unit ahead of time, they were gone, and the landlord gets screwed by that because the tenant doesn't need the money anymore. They don't care about their judgments. Um, it's almost like a dare at this point, dare, dare the landlord to go get a judgment, um, and so the landlord gets hurt. We have literally been fighting that argument for the last, I would say, you know, almost two months, Deb, uh, I, over and over and over. It has to be the landlord, it has to be the landlord. Well, I will tell you, in the version of the bill that's 85% good to go, the landlord will be the only party applying for that. That is what we heard as of this morning. Um, the tenant, right now, they want the tenant to sign off on it. What we screamed at this morning was, again, we just showed you the tenant doesn't care. The notice should be in a direct mailing or a version of something that comes from HCR to tell the tenant the landlord has applied on their behalf. But it doesn't really matter if the tenant assents to it. So that is one of the pieces I can tell you we are arguing back on is that great that the landlord can apply, but if the landlord can only apply if the tenant signs on, it's as good as if the tenant's doing it and nobody is, is going to do this. So um, but that, that is, as of, as of this morning, that the landlord will have full access to apply. The other piece to what Deb alluded to was whether or not the tenant is still in possession or not, it shouldn't matter. It is a contract that the tenant signed on for you. So from March of last year through now, if at any point you lost rent, the landlord should be able to apply for those funds. They are covid fixed time period. It does not matter again if the tenant is sense or if the tenant is in possession. We heard that that would be something that they were heavily pushing back on today to be in our favor. So that's another good piece of the news. I always come with good news first and I will give you the bad news in a second. Um, so that is all looking really good. Um, the bad news part of this is that the $100 million rent relief funds, which Deb alluded $40,000 or yeah, $40,000 million dollars went to um, downstate. The reason why it did not go upstate is because the AMI was at 80%. The AMI for 80% for upstate areas is just ridiculously too high. Um, you know, roughly thinking about it at a $50,000 threshold. Nobody who is uh, rent burdened for the most part is making that salary. Now, there are exceptions, of course. There are people, there are professionals, um, you know, who we saw go through this with, you know, brokers. And, and we have personal friends that lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in COVID. That's not to say that it's not the exception, but it's not the rule. The general rule of AMI at 80% is just too high for our area. So we didn't see people qualify. The bad news is that the federal guidance to the dictation of these monies across all 50 states is dictating an AMI at 80% again for landlords who own 20 units or more. For landlords who own 20 units or less, 
AMI is scheduled to be at 50%. So there will be preference if this bill goes through to those of you who own 20 units or less, that anyone who owns 20 units or more, it's back at 80%. To, um, to our credit, I think I'm, I'm gonna directly put this on under one roof's shoulders. To our credit, we have been tasked from many of the upstate delegation in the assembly specifically um, to be kind of their ears and their voice and to tell them what's happening upstate for the last year. They call on us routinely. I will get phone calls from the legislature directly asking me for legal input or asking us to interpret something. They call Deb for real-time scenarios about what she's experiencing for story purposes. They have asked me to do legal work in some capacities for clients and constituents in their areas. So when I say that we have people heavily relying on us, um, that is because for the last year, literally, they have seen Deb and Jamie in Albany. I mean, up until COVID, we were there weekly um, in their offices. I mean, they know us on a first name basis now, which is awesome. These people last night in our corner went to bat and stood on the floor in the assembly, and I'm not going to name who they were, but they screamed bloody murder about this AMI. And the fact that they have listened to all your stories, anyone who's on my round table, I take back what is said every time to our lobbyists and then to Albany directly. And literally we have said, private equity ownership out of New York City will buy up upstate unless you stop this differential and giving $1.3 billion to the city and not affording upstate any money because the AMI threshold is too high will basically cause the demise of upstate affordable housing. They heard us. They are literally on the floor of the Senate and the assembly arguing that point right now. What, what happens, we can't make promises, but I can tell you we were heard and they are trying to get a regionalization for the appropriation of money to upstate. That is a huge win if we get that. So just know that the original text of the law, whatever happens, and it's scheduled to be passed tomorrow um, for to be signed on Monday. If it happens, it's the direct result of this group because your stories and your purchase and sale contracts that came across my desk or, you know, Rich, your personal story. Um, so many of you shared those same things that we keep saying it's a domino effect. And if you have equity ownership, buy out the small guy, there'll be nothing left. And the funny part of this is, and, and I'll let Deb share some of these stories, we've tried to work with tenant groups. We really have um, to, to our peril, to our like skin crawling sometimes because they don't speak in language that we can understand a lot of it. A lot of it is these ideals that are so out there, they make no sense for the common person um, to understand where they're going. But we have tried because we want to bridge the, the tenant and the landlord groups. And one of the funny things that they keep saying is they want to preserve small business landlords. Well, here we are, do something. And yet New York giving the money into hands of equity ownership, you know, the left rack cities, let's just take that for, for a story. It's not going to help anybody. I understand it helps a tenant somewhere, but it doesn't help preserve the backbone of what is upstate and we're not the same. So we keep pushing for regional carve outs. You, you will constantly hear me more, much more than Deb berating. We, we are not New York City, we are not New York City. I mean, when we started our 400 person convention at Turning Stone, we were upstate landlords. I need for you guys to think of that going forward when we're starting to get ramp up again with HSTPA coming out for the arguments about good cause eviction or this Kavanaugh bill that I'll touch on for one second before I turn it back to Deb. Um, those carve outs, we need upstate landlords to come together because we are not New York City. And, and that's the one point that I'm gonna keep harping on is we do need to regionally diversify that because what New York City gets in monies to a tenant for one month could equal three or four months for an upstate landlord. They're not the same. And so when we see things like they'll pay back seven months of rent, 
the New York City landlords are getting much more enriched in monies than upstate is, and it's not fair. So um, we're trying to get that done. Um, the new senator in Syracuse, God bless him, he is somebody we've got to work with. Um, that hopefully, incoming mayor of Rochester, let's hope. Um, who will be on my roundtable to talk to all of you guys in the next week or two. He's somebody who I think could help us in the future, but all of this is something that we got to keep our pulse on to keep hammering home. We are not New York City. Um, the Kavanaugh bill, just the last things I will say is that there is a backdoor harping or I guess trying to bite the apple. I don't know how we say this politely um, at good cause where if you get the money, then you cannot evict a tenant for a year and you cannot raise your rents for a year. Um, you heard me yesterday, if we were on my round table, call that a hostage situation. Um, that is where I feel like the lawsuit will be right, um, right away. Like to me, that's just completely a taking. You are completely invalidating a, a contract when a landlord who's previously owed arrears is made whole. And now going forward, you are subject to not being able to operate your business while the tenant gets to, to basically not pay rent for another year. Um, it's incentivizing this horrible system to keep perpetuating itself. Um, so we will have our eye on that. We did push back on both those pieces. We did hear that Kavanaugh was amending that language. Um, one of the staffers told us that. So, so that's also good. So just to give you an idea of kind of what we do in the background, um, we've been talking to central staff. We've been talking, when I say central staff, the chief legal counsel for the assembly and the chief legal counsel for the Senate. Um, we've been on their radar. We've been having conversations and we've been talking to the chairs of housing for the Senate and the assembly over and over again. Um, luckily, Lisa Morello has a really good relationship with both. And so we get these access to meetings still. Um, but, but that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, you know, the courts will open, the courts are opening again. Um, I get called over to a couple today. There's more and more opening daily. Um, it's a patchwork piece. OCA needs to be dealt with. I would say we definitely need to fix the court system, um, but that's kind of where we're at with the funding and, and hopefully that will work in our favor. Um, obviously, I can't give you guys promises, but that's the most re that's the most up to date on the floor. If I get anything, it will be tomorrow morning saying something passed. Um, but fingers crossed. Deb, do you want to know? And I'll, I'll wrap this up real Jamie. briefly, just to let you know that the other good things that we are doing. I was actually in a meeting yesterday with the senator, and she came right out and she actually admitted that she's not clear how, and she's a new senator how they are supposed to be passing bills in the housing industry when they know nothing about how our industry works. And I looked at her and I said, thank you for acknowledging that. So we've talked about forming task forces and other kind of groups that involve good landlords so that they can understand whatever they're thinking. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they have to understand the impact before they do it. And not when they're going there to vote on it, we need to understand the impact before it even grows legs. So that's a good thing. The other good thing I can say about the work that Jamie and I are doing, we're both pretty loud and we're both pretty relentless and they've realized we're not going away and they can't make us go away. And they're, I think that's one of the reasons we're listening to us and we make sense, you know, we make sense. Again, there's right and there's wrong. And I've also made it clear that, I don't know if any of you have read any of the, the laws that are already on the books for New York State. We really don't need any more laws. If they would just enforce the laws on the books instead of piling layer after layer and making this a maze, I think the world would be a better place. And they've acknowledged that too. So keeping our fingers crossed, we're gonna make some headway going forward once this, this mess is over. And we, we just wanna make it a better place for everybody because this is a good industry. And again, thank you for having us. Hey, Jamie, there was a question in the chat as you were talking about what AMI stands for. Do you maybe want to touch on that just so that brings everybody yeah, up to it, speed? It is the area median income that is correct. Um, so it's a percentage of what the average income in the local area equates to. I believe 
at 80%, I think when Deb, we calculated it for like the upstate area, generally it's around 50,000. Don't, you know, box me in there. It's just general math. And I believe at 50%, it'd be about 34,000. Um, so it's just a, it's an idea of, you know, where the average person is and that's what they're using as a threshold. If you make over that limit, you would not be eligible to receive the benefit of the money. If you make under it, you would. So by putting the AMI at an 80% threshold, right out of the gate, it is a metric too high for most people to be able to um, afford, get that, get that housing um, voucher afforded to them. So um, it is something that, you know, we are super concerned. It needs to be lowered. Um, if you don't meet that threshold um, and you're not eligible and then your landlord isn't eligible, then we are in the situation we're in right now, which is upstate got screwed, downstate got most of the money. And even then $60 million is still outstanding. I did get told today, however, it's the 1.3 plus the 60. So they did say that this morning plus any more federal funding is all going into this housing fund. So it's all set to be distributed under the new federal rules. The, the other thing I can say too, is that until Jamie and I relentlessly badgered these people, their definition of a small landlord or helping a landlord was 10 units or less with one of those being owner occupied by the, the owner. And we had to make it clear to them. So like I had said, when I first started talking earlier, when I had 10 units, I had a full-time job. I had a full income. So if I had a problem, I had a paycheck coming in from somewhere else. If you truly are a person who is out there working every day and you have 50, 60, 100 units, you don't have time for a full-time job. So again, it's education where, I, I don't know if they just, again, don't, don't understand, don't listen, but uh, we have a lot of people listening Unfortunately, it's in the minority, but let's, again, keep our fingers crossed. You never know what tomorrow holds. Let's hope something good, not bad news. Um, for those of you, while I have your attention to just as a closeout to everything, if you don't watch LinkedIn or you're not on Facebook, there is a new notice provision. I want to make sure everybody on here, this is something that came out of left field and, I, and landlords are going to get sued by the AG on this. I, I just feel it. So um, if you do not know what I am talking about, there is a notice provision for noticing people that there is a new reasonable accommodation um, ability to apply. That's always been the ability, but now it's like a notice provision to tenants that says you are eligible to ask for a reasonable accommodation. That notice has to be distributed to all your tenants that are existing um, by the end of the month. And if you have new tenants going forward, it will be 30 days of the date they apply, whether or not you accept them as tenants or not, um, there are prospective tenants in there. So just wanted to put a plug out for that really quick so no one gets caught up in that. Um, Jamie, re reasonable accommodation for what? So how, for them, if they are going to be a tenant of yours that let's say that they are disabled and they need a grab bar or they need an emotional support animal, it's just a notice stating that they have the right to ask for that reasonable accommodation. I don't wanna confuse anyone. It's not actually the process of going through the request for a reasonable accommodation. It's just a notice. The tenant does not sign off on this, but it's just an, another layer to tell the tenants their rights um, to do so. Uh, so it's, it's all advocating on behalf of the tenant. If you're not catching the gist of New York State, wait until the budget passes because I guarantee we're all going to turn white before when, that. When does this notice have to be distributed and where? So it it is within 30 days of the date a tenant applies or the 30 days from the date the law became effective, which is March 2nd. So that's why I'm saying for everyone to do it by the end of the month for all your existing tenants. Awesome. Oh, and yeah. This, this is on top of the, the fair housing notice we have to do. This is on top of the yep. lead affidavits we have to do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Keep it going. Keep it going. I, I think Andy said it best yesterday. He was like, oh, geez, <laughs> like, just more layers. Yes. 
Um, and they're not done yet, guys. Um, you know, I, I teach fair housing. I'm purposely teaching it late this year because I know there's more coming. So hang on. But I just, I, I didn't mean to disrupt the conversation, but it is important while I have people to listen to, to, to just plug that notice. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so part of this was a discussion uh, with our panel of local investors, as well as uh, Debbie and Jamie, about kind of where we are and where we're going and how this affects the entire industry, not just landlords. Um, landlords are clearly the hardest hit out of this entire situation uh, to the point where we're not even calling landlords landlords. We're changing their name to housing providers, right? Because landlords are bad and housing providers are okay because we're in the world of political correctness and it is what it is. Um, we're not going to change that. We're just going to play the game. And that's what we have to do to keep our heads above water, right? Um, so we have brought in, and they were kind enough to volunteer, a couple of people from the local under one roof movement that are helping to organize it here in Rochester. So that would be Kayla Fessick and Jacob Thorpe, both from Gray Capital. And uh, Rich Tyson is here to kind of tell his story and put his two cents in because he is deeply involved in the, uh, the uh, raising the alarms uh, in our area locally uh, against what's happening. Um, so I would like to just uh, say thank you both for being here. Uh, and to uh, Rich, thank you so much for coming in to kind of tell your story and support. And I'm going to, at this point, kind of open it up to uh, Jacob and Kayla to talk a little bit about Under One Roof in Rochester and how they're helping to organize that movement locally. And then we're going to open it up to the floor for Q&A and discussion and all the other stuff, because really the focus of this is this isn't just something that's going to hurt landlords, this is going to hurt property values, this is going to hurt investors uh, on a higher barrier to entry, there's all sorts of stuff coming down the pipe and we just need to make sure that uh, everyone is well aware and prepared because we are here to help provide information. So with that, I will turn it over to Jacob and Kayla. Hello, Andy. Thanks for putting us on this, this call. Uh, Kelsey, Rich, Kayla, and I called Jamie about two months ago now and um, offered to help in whatever way we could. We're all, we all happen to be locals in Rochester. So what Jamie said was they needed people with boots on the ground to help ground swell some kind of movement. So uh, we put together a team that meets every other Thursday now of representatives from all eight upstate regions that just kind of do the legwork and connect the dots in their local areas, you know, Buffalo, North Country, Mid-Hudson, everything, um, just to kind of do the day-to-day, -day, not the day-to-day, -day, but the like ground level action that the lobbying team and the state level movement asks for. Um, so in terms of local activity, there's n n nothing in striking. But it's just the coordination of the statewide like messaging that the lobbying team asked us to put put together and things of that nature. That's what we've been spending a lot of time doing for the, the cause. Uh, Rich? Yeah, so don't let Jake downplay his, his role in all this. He is the most organized person on earth and keeps everybody on track. So um, one thing that I think is I've tried to keep quite consistent in any of the commentary I've provided, any of the videos that I've put out, uh, is that I am an independent broker in Rochester. Um, I do not hold any position with any of the, the groups, um, and that's strategic. Um, I'm, I'm a, I, I can appreciate the ability to be a lightning rod for issues and am um, and, and willing to take that on. Um, to give you, I guess, like a, maybe a one minute background, um, I ran for city council in 2010 as a Republican, which you can imagine how that went, um, though I did get 26% of the vote. Um, but I, I did so because I grew up in Monroe County and identified that if we've got a concentration of poverty and that exists within the city limits, you know, we could either bitch about it and, and pay higher taxes that funnel back into that concentration of poverty, or we can try to maybe change the circumstances within the concentration of poverty in order to maybe not have it continue to be a concentration of poverty. So um, after realizing that the residents of Rochester were not going to vote for me in their city council to try to make some changes, um, that was when I was a, a W-2 employee working in telecom. Um, I ended up getting into real estate and followed in the path. My mother's been a broker since I was two. 
and, and really um, identified that I still wanted to make a positive impact within the city limits and felt that doing so via providing housing opportunities, especially to those that are at, uh, I guess, it, the, that are the worse off, right? The people that have the least opportunity for housing would be the way to do it. I had a good friend um, who actually was uh, the person who married my wife and I, who was a jail chaplain, and um, understanding the issues that kind of come around. If you don't have stable housing, you can't have a stable life. Right, so um, really embarked on what could what, what could I do, and, and teamed up with a friend of mine um, from middle school, and we started investing into rooming houses. Uh, the first six purchases we made were six rooming houses, totaling about 50 rooms, and what that allowed for was the opportunity for someone who has the, the minimal amount of assistance, which is you know $435 a month coming from Monroe County's Department of Human Services to obtain housing. We provided them a bed, we provided them a refrigerator, but more importantly, we provided them a place to call home in the hopes that they would take that opportunity and then to rebuild themselves. Um, most of the, the, you know, the tenants that I had initially for the first few years were people coming out of incarceration, coming out of rehab, out of homeless shelters. And after those acquisitions um, started branching out into more of your traditional singles, multifamily type of properties. Um, I uh, attended one of Jamie's uh, meetings uh, at, at that fantastic event center that's kind of next to her office over there at the Culver Road Armory and thought, well, you know, she seems like she's totally on top of this. I guess I don't have to do anything here anymore. And, um, and, and kind of went back to putting my business together and acquiring properties and trying to keep the wheels on, right? Um, and not really realizing at the time that when Jamie was saying, you guys got to get organized because these people are trying to eat your lunch. Um, I didn't believe it. And she was right. So when she says we've got to get organized, she's she's totally correct. Um, the Tenant Protection Act really started. Uh, I saw a, a change in the attitude in rent payment, um, especially catering to people who don't have a garnishable wage. Um, payment became less frequent, uh, which was really troubling to me, knowing that I wanted to continue to provide this type of housing opportunity to folks, but also not being an independently wealthy person myself. I couldn't afford to do so um, without rent coming in and really started trying to pick up that fight at the beginning of last year with both the county legislators and the city council to say, we've got an issue. This Tenant Protection Act is, is you know, reducing the number of people paying rent. Um, this is going to directly impact the concentration of poverty that unfortunately exists within the city limits. And as the folks that are the, the legislative bodies that govern this, this area, you guys should get ahead of this and really start leaning on your um, New York state counter uh, counterparts in their legislature to try to, to maybe get some sanity brought back into the equation. And obviously I was met with not too much assistance. Um, and then it got to a point at, towards the end of last year where I had reached a point where I had lost more rent than my entire property tax liability to both Monroe County and the city of Rochester and then started basically just barking up everybody's tree with letters and sending certified mail out and then figured what the hell I'll, I'll start reading this stuff, putting it on YouTube and on Facebook. And maybe I can connect with some other folks that are experiencing the same, which is where I met, uh, you know, Jake and, and Kayla and Kelsey and a few other folks. And, you know, we decided we need to get organized. And I knew of Jamie's organization, having seen um, her presentation previously. So said, well, this is probably a good place for us to go. And, you know, I think they had kind of caught wind of it as well. So that's where we directed our efforts. Um, but again, I've intentionally not taken an official role um, because I do understand that the lobbying effort can be mud muddied up with someone who's maybe um, a little less politically correct. And I am not someone I think that would ever be accused of being politically correct. I'm very happy to take on the issues um, for face value. The other thing that gave me some insight, and, and I would say it was probably, I was, it was very insightful, but also disheartening, was I was asked, because I had reached out to the county legislators to serve on the RAISE Commission, the Race and Structural Equity Commission, specifically within the housing subcommittee on that commission and, and served some time on there. I was uh, disheartened to find that I was the only person who actually provided any housing opportunities other than to myself um, on that subcommittee. It was basically, um, there was a few people from the county. Um, there was a person who worked for the VA um, in finding you know, homeless veterans some housing. So they had some experience, but there was really no other housing providers, you know, landlords in the traditional sense. Um, 
on that panel, and there was an awful lot of the, you know, self-proclaimed um, Rochester's tenant union that were on that. And, and what I learned quite quickly is I was enemy number one, number one being a landlord and also being white, you know, the worst kind. And, um, and really basically them telling us very specifically and, and without any hesitation that they want to destroy um, profitability in housing. They do not like the idea that people are profiting in housing. And I obviously asked an awful lot of questions that got me in a lot of trouble with those folks as to, well, what's your plan if we eliminate all of the private property owners? Um, and really, that's where the adaptation of the language came into, you know, we're not going to call ourselves landlords anymore. That term has been polarized as, I mean, even Pepe Le Pew's been polarized, right? So like everything's being polarized. So you know, let's not call ourselves landlords. What are we? We are housing providers. And how are we providing that housing? We're doing it via our personal property, which we have a 14th Amendment right to own and possess. And right now, those rights are being trampled on because we are being forced to offer our personal property up without compensation. Um, that doesn't work at Wegmans. Danny doesn't let me fill up my cart and walk out the front door um, just because I'm hungry. He, he wants me to pay for that product. Otherwise, he's going to probably have me arrested. So, um, just kind of throwing myself in the lion's den, I saw quite quickly what we were facing, um, and that's why I've remained pretty independent, um, and I thankfully am independent. I don't have a W-2 income. I am a real estate broker, and I, am a, and I am a housing provider, although it's basically become a volunteer activity at this point. Um, and I can also share, not share, that there's probably going to be some very good news, hopefully coming out of Albany County tomorrow of which I may or may not be a plaintiff in a potential lawsuit um, that would be looking to um, restore our, our rights to due process because the um, declaration of hardship has essentially um, created a situation where someone can, without any proof, um, claim that they are either experiencing a financial hardship or potential health hardship if they were to be evicted. Now, my standpoint on this, the entire time is I do have people that are behind on rent. And if they have actually been impacted financially, I don't want to evict them. You know, I, I reiterate it and it, it, it seems to strike some people as surprising, but as a housing provider, I actually don't like going through the eviction process. In fact, I like long-term tenants. I pride myself on buying properties and having people that were tenants at the time and remain tenants for years to come. So um, I don't, want to pursue an eviction on someone who's been actually impacted financially. And, and for the folks that have been able to prove to me that they have been, I have not initiated an eviction process, you know, uh, action against them. And I won't. Um, there are people that have been coming with what they can each week and throwing a little bit of money at me. And I'm very happy to take that. And there's probably a good chance if we can't identify relief for them at some point, that I'm going to wipe away the past debt because I'm a human being. And I have, you know, I've lived paycheck to paycheck in my past from time to time, thankfully not recently, but I know what that feels like. Um, but the problem really in lies, I think the Tenant Protection Act created the foundation for something like a moratorium to be abused. We are not able to screen people properly going into the relationship of housing provider and tenant. There's literally no recourse that's meaningful to a portion of the community. And that's for people that don't have a garnishable wage. So if, you know, we, we need due process, we need to go to the courts. And as I've said it before, and I'll say it, I'd say it to a judge, if I can get to a court hearing and someone can prove that they've been impacted financially, I'll drop the eviction proceeding and let's go find them relief. The reality of it is, and I think it's been touched on once or twice before, is that the people that aren't paying rent that haven't been able to access relief, it's because they don't qualify for it. Why? Because they haven't been impacted financially. If they have, they would qualify for it and this wouldn't be a problem. So this hardship declaration is simply a stick in the spokes of our ability for due process and it needs to go away. We need to get people into court. And, and I made a, a public challenge to Senator Kavanaugh, and I, he, not so surprisingly, hasn't called me back yet. If New York State were to take the position that they're going to step in and pay the rent in the interim until we can get to a time when it's safe to open the courts, I guarantee you the courts would be open tomorrow all over the state because the state would not tolerate people just claiming an inability to pay rent if they had to backstop that. They're forcing us to backstop it. And the reality of it is we can't afford it. Um, I'll leave you with this. One thing that I was, 
really it was probably the best thing that came out of my time on the Rays Commission was that the city has a study, and, and Andy, I can share this with you electronically so you can circulate it to your members. But the, they had an initial, um, what was it, initial findings, eviction data analysis that they conducted um, almost a year ago. It was uh, 7 2020 uh, that they put this together. But what it really, the data shakes out quite specifically. The people that own the least number of properties are the frequent filers for evictions. The types of properties that experience the most evictions are single families and multi, in doubles, I shouldn't say multifamilies, two family units. So as a real estate per, a broker and someone who helps people acquire real estate, it's quite clear. The people that have the least amount of money that are trying to get onto that ladder of wealth, you know, building and wealth creation via real estate, which is one of the oldest forms of wealth creation known to man, those are the people being impacted the most. So as much as the, the, the positioning of the tenant advocates, for lack of a better term, is that the people that are being impacted are these you know, big corporations and often white, it's, it's totally BS because we know that in a concentration of poverty exists minorities and minorities, be them immigrants, black, brown, Asian, whatever, those are the people that have traditionally had the least access to capital. So we are penalizing the people that have the least access to capital, which means those are the people that are obtaining the most affordable rental properties, which are singles and doubles. So we are penalizing these people. And I can speak from experience. Unfortunately, I have had to reverse the trend that I was trying to counter, which was my acquiring of properties within Rochester, was trying to combat the concept of absentee landlords. And the reality of it is, I've had to sell off 30% of my properties. At the beginning of last year, I owned 37 properties with 92-ish units in those. Now, again, five or six of those properties were rooming houses consisting of 50 units. I've had to sell off about 30% of my property portfolio in response to the fact that I couldn't pay my property taxes because the revenues weren't there. And I'll give you one guess as to where all but one of the 19 that I've sold so far have gone. They've gone to downstate larger entities that are gobbling stuff up here. So it is totally exporting property ownership. It's exporting wealth out of our community. And it, in what it, really the most disheartening part of that process was 15 of those properties were single families that I hoped at one point once paid off I could extend the opportunity to one of those tenants who was not able to pursue traditional financing due to credit issues or criminal history or whatnot and extend them the opportunity to become a homeowner, which is something that local property owners, local housing providers can and often do. So the, the narrative needs to be taken on head on. I'm happy to be a lightning rod for it. I'm not afraid to have the discussion surrounding race because the people that want to destroy us are using race as a shield to protect them from the, 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 the purporting of shit ideas, for lack of a better term, that they have been. And we need to be ready to fight this battle with the ammo that's being fought against us. And that is they're trying to polarize it via race. And they're trying to polarize the issue as if the only people being impacted are big bad guys someplace else. And in fact, those are the people that are benefiting most from the little guys being destroyed. So Andy, I appreciate your invitation to this meeting. Happy to entertain any questions. And um, again, I'll, I'll reiterate one last time for everybody. I'm an independent broker. Um, I, I have no position within any of these organizations, although I'm very happy to contribute and, and assist them. Um, but know that I need to be independent um, in order to take some of the, the paths that I'm going to be taking going forward. And um, I, will, I will leave you with this. Um, because tomorrow we'll potentially, we will see some news about a potential lawsuit, is um, there is going to be a need to um, rally some funding for that. And I know, um, you know, especially the, those of us that are being crunched, it's, you know, the idea of contributing cash to anything is, is a little bit of a tough ask. Um, I'm going to be putting some cash up. I don't have, you know, I'm not a big wealthy guy with deep pockets. Um, there are thankfully some other folks in other regions that are going to be contributing. But if you are at all interested in participating by contributing, um, I'm going to be getting some information to Andy after tomorrow potentially happens and um, we, can, uh, we can connect. And um, I would welcome your assistance on this because um, from what I understand, the potential action that's going to be taking place 
is likely to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of forty to fifty thousand. Um, and that's a substantial amount of money, but in the in the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively small amount compared to what I think probably many of us have uh, have already lost and will continue to lose if we can't bring some sanity back to the equation here in New York. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks, Rich. It's appreciated. Um, so with that, we'll open the uh, Q&A portion with the panel. So Jamie, Deb, Rich, Kayla, and Jacob, uh, if you can unmute yourselves, if your background noise will allow for it. I've got a couple of um, questions that were in the chat. Uh, Bill was asking if anybody knew if the money went into the state general fund, if it didn't get used by landlords and tenants. I don't know the answer. I do know the original 100 million was supposed to go back to the federal government. Uh, that was extended a couple of times and I have no idea where it sits now. Maybe somebody else does. It's going to be rolled into the 1.3. It is, okay. Is what we were told. Perfect. Um, Wait, what's being rolled in? Hold on. What's being rolled the in? $60 million overage from the rent relief fund. From, 29, from 2020. So yeah, the January um, that was rolled out where there was $100 million for New York State, that $60 million that was never dispersed. Right. Is the CARES Act. Yes. Under the CARES Act, yes. Which correct. has been extended to December 2021. You know that. Right. The okay. way that they said they were going to distribute that this morning was to include it as part of the overall money is going to the tenant. Correct. We'll see. And today we have $22 million sitting in our bank in Rochester, New York, waiting for distribution. Now we have a rollout coming out. Jamie, maybe you can maybe explain where that is right now. What, I'm sorry, what was the question? The $22 million sitting in the bank for the, for the upcoming rollout. What agency, what's going on with that, and where do we stand? Good question on that part. As far as the regional disbursement, um, you know, they took some of that money to hire an other council um, and used it for attorneys to make sure that the tenants all had um, legal advocates while we were in court. But now, as you know, court is closed. So um, I don't know the answer to that, Carl, and I don't want to be a, a person who says something and then doesn't really have anything to back it up. Um, my guess is that if I had to be, you know, magic eight ball is that none of the cities know what to do with this money. And they're all pointing fingers waiting at somebody else to tell them what to do with it. And at the end of 2021, we're probably going to have the same conversation. That is how much faith I have in them to disperse this money. Um, I don't know, to be honest, I can, I can certainly ask and try and find out. So, so what it is right now, uh, the city has $6 million. The county has like $20, $50 million uh, in the bank. And they're, they're combining the program to launch it into one program so not to duplicate processes. And there is a steering committee on March 18th, of which myself and Beth uh, Short are on, to establish the criteria for the rollout. So this is a, a big win in rent relief. There's money there. They're trying to figure out how to distribute and roll this stuff out. Now, the federal process, they gave, they gave guidelines on the federal arena, which is, yes. for example, 12 months back, right? The right. landlords can apply on behalf of the tenant. Certain things like that before, other than prior. Right. Well, it also gave the local agencies um, broad um, authority, yes. Discretion as to how to do that. Mm -hmm. They don't have to comply with the federal guidance. Correct. So the federal guidance is going to say, we could do 12 months in arrears. The local agency go, no, 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 no. We're going to do six months in arrears. So, mm -hmm. so they got that. So in the, in the next two weeks, the word has it by April 1, there should be some kind of a rollout in terms of the application process here in Rochester, New York. That would be excellent. Um, if you have any influence on that, what I will say is if there's any tie to the AMI, it's, you know, that's got to go. And then 
any threshold to you know unit size at this point everybody's hurting we're trying to get away from unit size discretionary spent you know affording people um relief it, it really should just be if you come and you apply and there's money pay it i mean it, it's crazy well, i'm glad you brought that up so so one of the rules are they have a priority class of 50 percent ami jamie right and then mm -hmm. second tier is 80 percent ami so they mm -hmm. are going they're basing that on that's the federal standard yes so the federal standard is the same thing it's 20 units and less is 50 percent. anything over 20 units is 80 percent. right yeah that's what we're trying to get them to get away from um for upstate so we'll see. so within the next three weeks we're going to have some solid stuff in front of us as to what's going on that's a good thing that is a good thing um I just, you know, I hope they do it in conjunction with the courts being open. My biggest fear is that they close the courts again because of this, but we'll see. Anybody oh, else? That'll be ugly. Um, so we've got a question about the notice uh, for accommodation. Does it need to be sent certified? Only as New York State can do. They give us these things to do, and then they don't tell us how to do it. So we don't have guidance as to service. I will tell you guys what I told everybody. And if you see my posts on Facebook or LinkedIn, same thing. Certified is obviously the best method because you have a proof that it's been done. If you have an opt-in to the um, TCPA, which allows you to text your tenant or to email your tenants in bulk, just make sure you have a some kind of receipt that it's been done. Um, First class mail, I am discouraging because you have no proof that it's gone. So again, just make sure um, it's either hand delivered with an affidavit or certified mail or some form of a read receipt or you know a printed email that you can keep a record of. Um, this is one of those things where the attorney general has broad latitude to decipher whether or not there is a scheme to avoid a requirement. And these are the kind of things that make me as a lawyer get really nervous because if you fail to do it for one, the insinuation is you failed to do it for your whole portfolio. And then they assess fines on each one that you didn't do under the general business law. So um, I just want to make sure you guys were aware of this one. Is this something you could put a disclaimer on, say on your uh, rental application? And just when they sign the application, they've got their notification to call it good? Yes, yes. Um, and they give you sample language um, that I linked in, in the chat over here for you. You can literally take that and put it on your application right now. That's fine. Um, it just has to be within 30 days of someone applying or if you have current tenants within you know, the next two weeks, I would say. I'm not even giving you till April. Get it done by the end of March. Um, so yeah, you going forward, this is something that much like, you know, you have your sprinkler disclosures that came out a couple of years ago that you have to say whether or not you have an operable sprinkler system. It's the same thing here. It's just a notice to tell them you have the right to ask for a reasonable accommodation. It's just telling the tenants more what they can do to make your lives more difficult. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm cynical tonight. <laughs> it's, else? it's okay. It's realistic, um, <laughs> which is which is fine. Mm -hmm. The uh, it looks like Alex asked if there was any word on the street about the eviction moratorium being extended again, and do we know what the delays look like in court? I know that some of the areas haven't taken any cases at all anywhere across this, you know, since this whole thing started. Yeah. Rochester is um, different. Rochester is very different. Um, okay. So let's break this out. The breaking news is that commercial evictions have been extended through May 1. The judge, cool. uh, the, uh, the governor May. did sign oh, that right, today. Right, yeah. Um, so, so that is May 1 um, with the uh, same ideal of there's certain standards. Um, whether or not that would apply to all commercial evictions. It's not a uniform moratorium. It's much like the current residential. You have to meet certain criteria. If you do, you get the benefit of May 1. Otherwise, um, that's through March 24th. For residential, um, no, there is no further talk of 
um, a moratorium, but keep in mind, like previous, we don't normally get something until the eve of the night when it's set to expire. The difference now is the governor has lost his executive powers. So the legislature will have to do that on their own. I don't think there's quite the same appetite um, for extensions that the governor was having um, that the legislature in its entirety would have to have. I, obviously, you know, Deb and I can't make promises to you that it won't happen. Um, what I think will happen is that post May 1, there, there is a rebuttable presumption in the current COVID-19 um, foreclosure and eviction emergency protection act, which allows to revert to the tenant safe harbor act. If you recall the tenant safe harbor act, which was the law on the books as of June 30th, um, that law states that warrants can't issue in any situation where the county still is under an emergency declaration um, for a state of emergency. So I do think that it will become a county by county situation for the warrant service and whether or not your court is set up for virtual accommodation um, could play out whether or not your courts are open. Um, I can tell you regionally for our area, Rochester City Court is hearing cases actively. They are almost, I would say probably at this point, maybe a month or two delayed on getting new cases, but they're getting calendared. They're, they're just out further. Um, to compare that to Buffalo, if you have key property in Buffalo for some reason, um, we have not heard a single case for the entire year in Buffalo yet. Um, they are just putting pre-COVID cases on as of this week. So I would anticipate Buffalo not being heard until the fall at this point. Um, I know Binghamton's completely shut down. Um, I know Syracuse, the city courts are, are moving. We have court dates though in some of the suburbs in May, late May. Um, I think that's a misinterpretation of the law, frankly, and we've been challenging that one-on-one -on -one for those courts. Um, Deb, I'm going to turn to you for Albany. Yeah, Albany is taking the filings, but our judges upon, so you know that you have to serve the hardship form, and then you have to file an affidavit saying whether you got it back or not. I know that our judge is asking the tenant when you get to court, if they have the form, and if they want to fill it out right there and then, thus putting the case off. I know Coho City Court uh, I went there today, actually. They're not even calendaring the cases until the judge has a chance to review all the documents and determine whether you can file them or not. I know Green Island is hearing cases. Uh, and again, county by or city by city basis. The other thing I want to point out, though, is I'm sure you folks followed all this. There was a back and forth between the executive order with Governor Cuomo and the administrative order with Judge Marks. So we haven't heard from Judge Marks in a while and I'm holding my breath because the pattern seemed to go, Cuomo would do an EO, Marks would do an AO. So they would take turns every three months extending the pain. So I'm hoping, I don't think the position Cuomo's in, I haven't heard talk that he will extend it. I'm just hoping Judge Marks doesn't extend it. Jamie, have you heard talk on that? I'm not. Um... And I think that it, with all this money coming and the vaccinations, um, I, I hope they don't do that. I mean, I just feel like it's the whole basis of all these lawsuits. It's, you know, it's an opportunity to be heard and it's, we've made the argument, it's hurting the tenants also. So like we represent both sides of, of the argument spectrum, which is a little different than most of the other real estate groups. We like to play devil's advocate. I am probably the most compassionate towards the tenant side of things, I just try and play that very um, dear because I understand that this is a symbiotic relationship. If we alienate tenants to, you know, the, the world, we don't have customers. And so, uh, you know, from day one, I have a hashtag compassion for tenants. Well, we're asking for the same thing for landlords now. And that's, that's where the envelope needs to be pushed. There's no compassion for, for landlords and we need to get there. But um it's the, the argument that I make from a legal perspective is these tenants 
they're incentivized not to pay their rent. When you put moratoriums in place, it is telling the tenant, you don't need to pay your rent because there's zero consequence that can come to you right now. Now, I used to think that was 90% of the population that would just ignore that and still pay their rent. Well, guess what? I got educated in COVID. That is probably flipped the other way now. Um, and I would say 10% of tenants are doing the right thing. Um, the number is just getting crazier and crazier. And um, so what we have keep, kept saying is that when you put a judgment on a tenant, the tenant may not care, right? Let's be honest. The tenant may just be like, whatever, I have 15 judgments, it doesn't matter. But if a landlord, and I, I'm kind of forecasting here and you're gonna hate me on this one, but if a tenant doesn't have to pass a credit rating, because the landlord's not able to pull credit as of May 1, let's say. And you take that tenant as a tenant and, and you know, then Deb, as the former landlord, garnishes that tenant's wages because she's owed money. Now I'm in a position where the tenant's not paying me rent and I have to evict them. All we're doing is kicking the can down the road. And from one tenant to another tenant, you know, from one landlord to another landlord, passing the buck and the bill, frankly, and these tenants aren't going to care because there's no screening mechanism that a landlord is ultimately going to be using to make sure that their property is safeguarded. And when we start going on that slippery slope, we start then getting behaviors and things that will disrupt neighborhoods. And it's very scary what the um, socialistic view of not being able to post tenants credit or not being able to utilize criminal history. These are things, and I'm saying them not to, to, to scare you, but to scare you. This is what's coming out of Albany um, in, in the budget. So, you know, it's, it's making sure they understand the business practice and that their decisions to help tenants are actually hurting the whole foundation of the entire housing industry. Um, and, and that's the larger education piece that we keep trying to teach them. Um, they don't understand what you guys do, not in the least. They think you just house tenants. They don't understand what the sweat and equity or the ownership or when you get rent, what, what you do with that rent. They think they you put it in your pocket, frankly. And what we keep telling them is it goes right back into the property. And if it doesn't go into that property, it goes into the next property, which houses more people. We have a tremendous homeless number problem here because of Governor Cuomo. And it started way before COVID. It's getting worse because of it. Um, and and you know, I know Rich and Jacob, you guys reached out to homeless shelters and they're telling you that, that same thing. The numbers are crazy. Um, it's a direct correlation with these moratoriums. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any question of that. Yeah, the other thing we pushed back on with the moratorium was the fact that when you go to court, I know in my situation, I know Jamie's situation, we were fortunate enough to, to get into court in that October timeframe of last year. And sadly, the only time some of our tenants get rent relief from the COVID money is by forcing the court action and in the court, then the judge will facilitate with a provider who's got the COVID money to marry the tenant with the COVID provider. Otherwise, as we know, the, the tenant's not taking initiative. So I know Jamie was very successful in getting some of the COVID funds for her clients. I, I got some, I wasn't so lucky with others because mine weren't COVID affected, so they didn't qualify. But I did get six lockouts. And I've had some, to piggyback on Jamie's comments, I've had some conversations with folks that are into, I guess, homeless placement, for lack of a better term. And they're saying that not only are they, well, what they're saying is that they're seeing like 30% of the requests for assistance um, for people that are, you know, typically, you know, at risk of being displaced this past year. And it's because, and, and I asked her, I said, well, what do you, why is that? If, if so many people are behind on rent, she says, well, because, because they don't think the bill's ever going to come due. You've got the, the, tenant, the tenant advocates, and I would say for lack of a better term, because they're not advocating for any tenants, um, telling people that, you know, just 
don't worry about it. Don't pay your rent. They can't evict you and everything's going to be fine. And what I think we're going to see at the end of this is we're going to see an awful lot of folks, um, you know, maybe people that are in poverty, but, you know, people do rise out of poverty at some point. You know, some do, thankfully. And um, what we're going to see is a lot of those people are going to be saddled with judgments and, and things that are going to prevent them from being able to take those next steps to get, you know, further up that the, the, the ladder of, of housing, you know, up to the next rung or two. Um, because the advocates are telling them, just don't worry about it, all is going to be fine. And maybe the wage that they have today is not garnishable, but, you know, hopefully many of these people are going to rise above that, the, whatever assistance they're on today or that wage that they're on today that's not garnishable, and they're going to achieve the ability to rise and, and move on. Um, but now they're going to have these major judgments against them, you know, hopefully, and I say that, you know, uh, you know as an unfortunate statement, but we, we've got to have some recourse, and that's like all we've got left. Um, but hopefully, you know, they're going to have that. And that's going to be something that's going to hinder their ability to progress as a human being, which I think is really disheartening as well in the, in the whole thing. And it's something that's being lost. And it's, it's, it's a, a, you know, it's an issue that's not going to be seen for maybe one, two, three years to come, but it's going to be seen. And then there's going to be no repair for that issue because, you know, the foundation's been laid and, and it kind of is what it is. Spot on. There's a uh, there's a question from Pat Burks uh, asking um, how landlords are being notified about all this. And the unfortunate truth is, if you're not in one of these groups going to these meetings or sitting in on Jamie's roundtable, you're probably not, because I've heard more bad information come out of the mouths of other lawyers than good information in the last, um, I don't know, let's call it six months. It's out of date. People are being told there's no evictions going on, all sorts of craziness. And I'll just let Jamie take it from yeah. there because the, the media is the worst enemy. Um, you know, you read some of these headlines and it's like eviction moratorium to May 1. And we're like, no, like there's, there's never been a blanket or cancel rent. Like rent's been canceled. Like, these monikers are so dangerous because that's what people hang their hat on. And, and, and that's why tenants, frankly, some of them are not paying rent. They just think it's been canceled. Um, and it's it's crazy. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I always like to encourage other attorneys to talk to each other. I'm, I'm not somebody who's like very territorial or any like that. I like working with other attorneys because I think if we can level the playing field and we can educate and collectively work together, we can come up with scenarios to fight the good fight together. You know, uh, you know, attorneys need to be on the front line of this talking and thinking through. And, and I don't certainly know everything. Um, I try and stick my nose in everything that I can lately because, you know, I feel like there's, there's no voice for, for some of you guys. Um, and so, you know, getting on the to the Rochester landlord panel this year or, or working with city council in Rochester to, oh, I'm on the housing reopening committee or um, on the city code violation board. I, I'm trying to involve myself in everything because I feel like it's all part of a larger puzzle um, and we need to understand how each of the fractions are working so that we can make these organizations that are frankly archaic work together. Um, but but that's just something that um, I think it's an education piece. I think, you know, this group and there's many others, Finger Lakes Landlord, um, our roundtable, NICRO's presentations. I think it's just educating yourselves and staying up to date. Um, I will say, if you're just looking for something really quick, it's LinkedIn where I post every day. Um, Facebook, it just, it gets a little crazy with people's pictures and scrolling through it. It like makes me like, overload for a little bit, but LinkedIn's just a little bit more professional. So I go on there a lot. Um, I am posting videos, which I'm not comfortable doing, oddly enough, um, but I am doing them. So like today, there is a video on that notice I did. Um, and I'm just trying to keep you guys as much up to date as I can. So if you do not follow, follow along on LinkedIn. I am on Facebook. I am part of that real estate investor group on Facebook. Now I'm posting in there. Um, but you know, and everything we can do, um, Dem and I intend to put a newsletter out to shortly, um, so that we'll keep you guys up to date. Yeah. You guys can also each of each person for free can go on the under one roof, New York website and oh, sign up and you will get our, our newsletter. It's not even a newsletter, but it's a blurb. So if something comes out that you need to know, and it gives you the round table dates and times and, and topics. So please go ahead, sign up, give us your email. You'll get on the email list. 
The other thing on that is um, Deb and I, for those of you who didn't attend in 2019, we did do a huge event at Turning Stone Casino. We will be bringing that back. Um, so this September, um, hang on for dates. We're do going to be doing a two day part. Um, the first day will be convention style. Um, Deb doesn't even know this. I was having lunch with lenders today and we were talking about breakout sessions where you know some the lenders actually were saying, you know, it would be cool if we did a segment on getting financing in multifamily and the different changes that COVID has posed and now what rent rolls need to look like and you know Q1s and threes versus just 12s. Um, so that is coming. We're going to do that in September where it'll be a full morning presentation. Hopefully we'll get our lobbyists to participate again, um, but it'll be educational in the beginning of the day, you know, perhaps for housing, perhaps sexual harassment training, any of the trainings that you need, um, followed by a networking and a poker tournament at night is what I am hoping to put together, um, and then a golf outing the next day. So keep in mind, these are, these are some of the things that we're going to try and do. Um, we're a fun group. For those of you who came out to our golf tournament this summer, um, we know how to have fun, but we also know how to be serious, but we also have to raise money. And that's the hardest part of the ask for Deb and I is to be the salespeople asking for money. But unfortunately, um, our lobbyists are very expensive. Uh, they're good, but they're expensive. The other part of that lobbying is um, because of good cause on the Rochester and Albany city fronts, it is our suggestion that we hire our lobbyist team, which would not be our lead lobbyist, but it would be their team to lobby locally in Rochester on our behalf and Albany on our behalf. Again, that's a money ask. We have to raise money to be able to do that, but we do feel very seriously about the fact that we need lobbyists on the ground fighting our city councils and our mayor. So just let you know that is something that we really are having strong discussions about. And um, obviously, Rich, Kayla, Jacob, that's coming to you um, for dis dispersing that information. Um, but we, we do feel that we have to fight this, unfortunately, on city as well as state ground now. So that being said, I don't own property. I don't have plans to own property. I do service the industry. Um, and one of the most important things we can do at this point is everybody here uses service providers to take care of their units in some form, whether they're direct employees, whether they're 1099s, um, get them involved because this will crush them because these big companies are not going to hire them to do the work. They're not. They're going to lose their livelihoods because they're going to go with the major players. They're not gonna use them. You need to get your crews and your teams involved in sponsoring and joining and supporting and doing whatever you can do because it's gonna get worse before it gets better. There's stuff coming down from the, from the state. It's in committee right now where they're gonna force contractors and managers to pay back all the lost wages, insurance, and comp for employees that get stiffed on the job. Guy who doesn't show up for work, gets fired, files a, 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 a claim against his employer that he's owed back wages and all this other stuff. Whoever hired him is going to be on the hook. So you property manager or you home builder or you remodeler, if your electrician sticks one of his guys, you're on the hook for everything. How do you afford that? Where is that going? And then you look at in the city, there's this licensing thing where you're going to have to be licensed to be a landlord in the city of Rochester soon. What are you going to do? Very true. Yeah, we need everybody. Um, the more sponsorship opportunities, the better. Um, and we had really, really cool prizes, I will say. Um, we made sure it was fun, but we, we gave away like four vacations or big prizes. So I think um, so. Maybe six. So, yeah, because there was one for male and one for female. So maybe yep. six. And you, you guys can also That's not donate allowed anymore, Deb. Money. It's not allowed anymore. <laughs> I know, right? What is that? The neutral gender. Uh, but you can also donate on the Under One Roof, Roof website, even if it's $5. It doesn't matter what it is. I know that Rich was talking about supporting this lawsuit that we are also supporting. And uh, I know that NICRA is making a financial a donation to that too. And, and anything, anything that you guys have to help is very appreciated. So we got to volunteer. 
We're not paid, just make that clear. We're both registered lobbyists because we have to be. By law, if you talk to these lawmakers for X amount of time, a week, a month, and you're not a registered lobbyist, then you get in trouble. So, you know, everything we're doing is paid for by NIPRA, which is paid for by member dues. And we have an awful lot of under one roof members that aren't NICRA members. So NICRA carries a big burden. The under one roof team, I know Freya gave us a great donation. I know a lot of you guys have given us great donations and we really appreciate that. But all the time Jamie and I give, we, we donate our time. So. And as a person yeah, who didn't listen to Jamie's uh, advice a year and a half previous, get organized and get involved because what's going to happen is the other side is totally organized. And to her point, they have, they have the ears and the eyes of the legislators. And when they don't see us show up at the table, what they assume is that we don't care. And it's because often we are far too busy trying to keep our businesses afloat, keep our, you know, our noses above water. And, um, and the other side has got an awful lot of free time, like way too much free time, which is probably part of the problem. And uh, they're, they're running busloads of people to Albany on those lobbying days and making themselves known and seen. And while we're all, you know, head down in our books and trying to run our, our businesses individually, and what we, we have lacked is organization because we didn't think we needed it. We figured, you know, I'm just going to stay the course. and I'm going to do my, my thing and I'm going to keep my business afloat. But there are literally people trying to take your business and rip it out from underneath you. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. They want to destroy us. They want to destroy the concept of private property ownership and any semblance of profit within that, even though they don't realize sometimes how little the profits are. Um, you know, so sometimes when there's the money ask, it's always like, well, you know, of course there's a ton of places I could put my money. Um, but the reality of it is, you know, they, they are out fundraising and they are, they are fundraising against us. They are trying to destroy our industry and you know what they're they're making some headway unfortunately so um so i'll i'll say it publicly again jamie i should have listened to you a year and a half ago i should have oh. gotten involved well it's true um so uh, you know i'm i'm guilty of it as well but um I, I have seen the benefit of being organized and um it's no fun you know joining the race when there's someone in a full sprint behind you towards that finish line we, we've got to get, we've got to get running. Let and me make another point to Rich's point. And here's the, here's where we fall short. I shouldn't say fall short. That's not appropriate. Here's where our challenge comes in. There are powers that be behind these tenant unions and these tenant advocates are paid. This is what they do full time. Rebecca Gerard, Sia Weaver, they are 100% paid. This is their full time job. And I've, I've heard rumors of who's funding them, but they have an agenda. Like Rich said, they are out to take our business. And this has been on the radar for a while while we're all volunteering our time to fight back. So that's where we're a little handicapped. But I must say, I think we have ethics on our side. I think we have honesty on our side. I think we have great people and drive. And there's such a difference between right and wrong. We, we are going to win this fight. So whatever, again, whatever you can do, even if it's not money, if it's time, that's huge. And last other, year, oh, no, I, was, I just want to give you an idea of last year um, when we had our lobbying in January, which is so weird that we were actually there last year, but we had 200 people come lobby with us. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. We were swarmed um, on the steps inside the Capitol. Um, they were screaming in Spanish to us um, in our landlord's faces. Um, Deb and I were upstairs in a meeting with one of the senators and we actually got pulled out and told to go down. Um, Deb's uh, nephew basically had to accompany me downstairs because they thought that we were going to literally get, get hurt walking alone in there. Um, and they were screaming and yelling at us and we had no idea what they were even saying or who they were. And it was a bus of tenants and what they were saying to us wasn't even meant for us because we weren't the group they thought we were, but they were yelling. So they're just um, real unprofessional, um, somewhat savage-like in, in some of the things they were doing. Um, they locked a pregnant staffer in the office. Um, remember that story we heard, Deb, and, and screamed and Capitol Police had to come. Um, they're not very well liked in Albany, 
but they are relentless. We need to become relentless professionally. I think that's the message if I can to give everybody is um, we need to continue to be loud and heard while representing the professional nature of the business you guys run. And to let that point. Provide, well, yeah, let me, uh, Andy, let me just provide a little bit of input here. Um, certainly agree with the comments made by Jamie and uh, Debbie. Uh, Freedom First is a coalition member of Under One Roof. I mean, we very thankful. We have in the past made substantial contributions to Under One Roof, and certainly um, think that individuals uh, on their own could could actually make contributions. But I just want to make sure that the members who are part of Freedom First recognize that that those dollars that go to Under One Roof from Freedom First is coming from their membership and the membership that they pay. And, and it's something that we've done in the past and we certainly intend to do it in the future. Uh, provide funds that would, that would help Under One Roof uh, to do the mission that, uh, that's outlined. So just want to bring that out, make sure people are aware of that. I mean, clearly a lot of the members aren't aware of the fact that we um, as a not-for-profit organization, getting our funds primarily from members, uh, that's where the monies are coming from. So just want to make sure people are aware of that. And I, I just want to reiterate, I, I think that each and every individual who is a housing provider needs to decide what portion of the funds that they provide that they receive, can, what can they provide to Under One Roof? Because Under One Roof is really fighting the battle for housing providers and for tenants that have the right message. And a lot of tenants don't, as Rick indicated earlier, but our tenants aren't bad, our landlords aren't bad, and we, we need to be a balancing point. And, but you know, clearly uh, a group of the folks who are that's, as you indicated, they just have um, bad blood for landlords because of the fact that we are on different sides of the fence that was created basically by, uh, by them. So I'll stop at this point and give it back over to Andy to uh, continue with the rest of the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, and also, just so everybody knows, Leon doesn't get paid. Neither does Susan, neither does Joe. They do this for free because they're passionate about helping people succeed in real estate. So I'll throw, I'll throw that out there too. But the other part of this conversation is don't forget that all of these tenants that are basically out lobbying everybody, it, it, number one, it's because they have the time, but number two, they live in the city. They're voting for these people that control the cities. When you look at the constituency of the locations where they're living they're voting for these people that they're lobbying. And in a lot of cases, landlords, property, property managers, housing providers, whatever you want to call them are not. So you're already starting at a disadvantage because one of you with a hundred tenants, well, there's a hundred of them clamoring to take your money away. So you're already starting, which means you need that much more action on your side to be successful. So that's, there's, there's that, I'll get off my, my soapbox now, sorry. No, thank you, and Leon. Totally true. Susan, thank you. Um, I mean, Deb and I from the bottom of our hearts, we, we couldn't do what we do without this group support. Um, I think it, that goes without saying, it's one of the largest contributors to the campaign that we run. So thank you, we greatly, greatly appreciate that. Yes, thank you so much. We do appreciate your support. Andy, I did bring that point up to the uh, Senator I was talking to yesterday on how they have 50, they could have 50 constituents to one landlord and that's an uneven playing field. And again, something they didn't think of, but um, we are pressing that point too. I wanted to quickly answer a question from Alex. He wanted to know what happens with good cause eviction if you want to sell a tenant occupied unit? Well, I can tell you, I'm also a real estate broker, not just an owner of uh, property, but the, investor that's looking to buy a building, they don't want baggage with it. 
So ultimately we are afraid it's going to decrease the value of property, which it's not a good thing. That's one of our, our pushbacks against good cause because you're, you're basically stuck with a tenant who you may or may not want to keep and the rent they're paying. You can't just go and increase the rent because part of good cause is, I believe it was a 3% annual increase. So you would inherit the tenant, you would inherit the rent and that, that cap. So it wouldn't be a good thing. And that's part of hurting the whole industry. And that's, that's part of the reason why we wanted to have everybody on tonight that, that is on and representing Rochester, because it's, it's not just about the guys who, and gals who provide housing. It's, it's about every part of this industry, property values, quality of property, neighborhoods, absentee landlords, all the things that they rail about they're causing. So everybody, everybody needs to be awake and aware. Um, of what's happening. And I, and I see one more question that's sort of out there. That's probably a Jamie Kane question. Um, Jose asked if there's a $20 application fee, what if there's a third party background check service that charges the tenant directly and they provide the landlord with it? Is the, are they still on the hook to reimburse for that or no? So if the tenant brings a copy of any um, credit report one, from any of the three services within 30 days, then the landlord has to accept that credit report, even if it's contrary to the credit report you choose to run for other tenants, meaning your screening would not be uniform, which is violating fair housing laws. And that's one of the you know, amendments that we are trying to get down the line for the HSTPA. It's, it's setting a landlord up for trouble there. Um, but if it's within the 30 days and they have a receipt plus the actual credit report, not just a statement, um, then you can use it. You can still run the background criminal check for now while it's legal in the state of New York. Um, and you can charge for that service to the tenant for the actual dollar amount that that report costs you. Um, and then the other question is, uh, I guess, if they direct if the landlord directs them to a third party service to do a credit and background check yep. and they have to pay that service but the answer is provided directly to the landlord does that circumvent it so no um it well it depends who's paying for it so if the tenant is is paying for it then the landlord can't charge if the landlord is going to be the one that's running the check or sending it through a third party, then the cap is $20 or the actual cost of what it costs the landlord. So in that situation, if it costs the landlord you know, $6 to run, all that the landlord can charge is $6, but it's $6 per tenant that you're running it on. So people have always asked, you know, can you charge it for the unit or can you charge it per tenant? My stance legally has been you could charge it per tenant everybody over the age of 18 being a tenant um, because you need to run it individually on each occupant. Cool. That answers your question. He's good. Uh, so I saw the thumbs up. <laughs> uh, so Jacob actually just asked if Topa is coming to New York SB 3157 and what is the likelihood of it passing? I know this is one of Carl's favorite topics too. He loves SB 3157. Hold on a minute. Let me just check what this one is. There's so many that I don't want to misspeak to this. I've not heard this. Um, this is federal. No, it's in the New York State Senate. Um, Zelnor Myrie. Mm -mm. This is the year plus. Uh, establishes a tenant opportunity to purchase. I'll put the mm -hmm. link in the chat. Mm -mm. No, I don't think so. Um, that's just so left. Um, no, I, I, I see, I see that, and I should never say never. <laughs> but it's so out there. It's so New York City. It's so. I mean, if we get to the point where that happens, where there's an Illion bill um, on the federal side from Minnesota that is very similar, where tenants would have an opportunity to purchase. Um, or have a right of first refusal right in the deed to the property. If that happens, I mean, let's be honest, how many of you are going to be in the state, 
Like it, it's just, it's one of those things that um, it would cripple this. And I think they recognize that. I mean, we are, we are years in my opinion, away from any socialistic ideal of there won't be individual property owners. I don't think that's happening even with the climate um, that we're in. There is still mainstream ideals. Um, now, anything could happen with the governor change. I, you know, we don't know, but right now I don't, I don't personally see that happening. I don't, Deb, you might, you might that's have a theory. A that was a slip. Are we having a governor change, Jamie? <laughs> there yeah, may no, be other candidates. We'll right, just leave it right. there. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to, but again, Jamie and I have had our mouths hanging open at some of the stuff. And the sad part is, I, I, and I'm sure you guys know this, before I became a lobbyist or involved with uh, the under one roof lobbying effort, I am really surprised at how many dirty back deals and how many unethical things are done amongst our elected officials that are supposed to be working for we the people. And it's very discouraging because something will pass or something will happen that's totally, it's not in the best interest of we the people, but sometimes that just doesn't matter. So, and it, it all comes down to the almighty buck or a favor or something. So I'm hoping it doesn't happen, um, but never say never. But I, 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 if I had to wager on it, I'd say not soon. <laughs> never know what's gonna happen next year. Don't give up on New York property yet. I, I would say that. Diversify. Go ahead. Yes. Diversify. <laughs> Insulate yourself just like anything else. Yeah, but think of it this way. The word. Yeah, take it, from, uh, take it from some of us who have been around for a while. We never thought we would be where we are right now. Yeah. And so it's, 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 um, it's sad, you know, from a sort of do what's right and what's appropriate sort of thing. And a lot of people, what's right and what's appropriate is substantially different than most of the people on this call. But yeah. look at it this way, Leon. Look at how long you've been in the industry. Look at how much you've given to people in the industry. And maybe if there is a governor change, we might have an opportunity to make a difference in this industry. If I, I would love to see a group like ours and us just stay together and keep pushing. Maybe we can affect change in this industry. Maybe we can rewrite laws or get rid of some of these laws that are that that just don't work um and i, I do believe good wins over evil so d don't give up the fight yet oh well, no i've um i've been through a lot of fights but if you never, want to i, I never give a real estate broker in rochester <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to see purchase contracts on my or sale contracts all over my desk yeah because that means guys don't Jane. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to run us out of Dodge. Ask Jamie, three or four times during COVID, I was done. I was out. It's going to Florida. And you know what? God told me I had other plans. So let's let's not give up on this. We've got this. It's frustrating, but I, I think we're going to be okay in the end. Uh, and one other question from Alex and Michelle. Can you terminate a lease to sell a unit vacant with good cause eviction in place? And I believe the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I believe that was one of the stipulations they added to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't know. So, so you guys understand good cause. Um, there's different, every time the law gets like reintroduced, something changes. So like, I don't even bother to look at it until we know it's got traction anymore. Um, but we are going to do a whole round table on this potential good cause piece um, with local lobbying on the next round table. So stay tuned on Wednesday for that if you're interested in that piece. Um, but I believe that's part of the prohibition on it. And um, it, it's one of those things, Pam Hunter, she is the assembly woman in Syracuse. She is the counter to Julia Salzar. So Julia Salzar's got the Senate for the bill and um, Pam Hunter has it for the assembly. Um, it was very damaging to upstate that we had an upstate person supporting good cause for the state. Um, 
right before COVID, literally the, the day I think before everything shut down, I sat in her office and she promised me she was removing her name and that she didn't stand for good cause anymore. And she thought that the bill had gone rogue and it wasn't what she believed in. And those were her words. She has put her name back on that bill and reintroduced it. So um, we plan to meet with her directly, uh, but just know that like the wind blows and, and these people get reemerged into these ideals when someone pushes something and they want their name on something. So um, it, it will change a few times, but that was one of the things, um, you know, obviously that could change, but um, it's increasingly going to be harder to, to operate um, how you get rid of a tenant, how you sell your unit, and then also the component of universal rent controls included in that. So there would be caps on what you could increase your rent annually. Well, I, so let me just add something to that because my question is, is that um, I don't want to rent. I'm not, I'm not interested in increasing anybody's rent. I'm not interested in doing anything other than just selling the property. So I did read that the bill proposal to, to what degree I understood anyway, because it was just a bunch of legal gobbledygook bullshit. Um, so it, it, um, did I understand it correctly that I would have to offer it for sale to the tenant first and they would either have to decline or accept if that were the case or because I just simply uh, I you know to be perfectly honest at this at least at this very moment I'm completely frustrated and I could I mean if I could set New York on fire right now I would and, and would leave um, because it's really just hell on earth at the moment um, <laughs> So I guess my, my, my thought was, is I'm just going to tell everybody kindly, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a housing provider any longer. Go find other housing. I've decided to sell. No, yeah, I'm not so increasing anybody's rent. I'm not doing anything detrimental to their lifestyle. I just want to get out. I want to sell my business like every other human being is allowed to do that owns a business on the face of the earth. Alex, you can do that now. Good cause is not in effect right now. When no, I know that, but I, I have tenants in place. So therefore I have a giant shit pile in my units because I mean, I basically have the, the red scourge now and I can't do that because no investor wants to touch one with a tenant in place and I can't get them out because of the moratorium to sell them vacant in order to sell them to somebody who actually wants to own a home, which is better for everybody so i'm and by the time the moratoriums yeah did good cause will be in place yeah so we're i mean we're literally you know we're in between a rock and a hard place so mm -hmm. uh and this isn't just me this is all that this is the 200 plus doors that i manage for this is my own portfolio this is anybody who i counsel as an agent and a broker that wants to start investing in new york right now it's you know it's a time bomb it's not, you know, it's fine if you believe New York real estate isn't going to be flushed down the toilet, but as it stands right now, anybody who's got, you know, uh, five cents worth of common sense in their head thinks this is just ridiculous. You're, you know, this isn't the place to, to do business currently. So, I mean, I want to sell and get out because I can't take it. I mean, the stress and the, I mean, I personally have $25,000 that's out of my pocket just in the 13 doors that uh, the properties that I own, not to mention the 200 plus thousand dollars that's gone uncollected from my business, which means I'm not getting my management fees. I can't conduct the health maintenance to be done. I'm getting uh, threatened by the city to have services rendered by them because we can't do that as a service provider because my owners can't provide they don't have, they don't simply don't have the money to conduct the service that needs to be done. So I, I to my point, my the long winded rant that that was, I just want to get rid of these people and sell them vacant to somebody who's actually going to enjoy the house and use the house for its intended use, not to screw me as the small business owner. So to answer the question, if the unit's vacant, you can do it. If the unit's occupied, so let's say that you had a tenant in there and you wanted to sell while the tenant was residing in there, the only way under this proposed bill you could do so is if 
in good faith, you were seeking to recover possession of that housing accommodation located in a building containing fewer than 12 units because of an immediate or compelling necessity for you or your own personal use, or, at, well, and it's end, occupancy is your principal residence or the residence of a spouse, a child, a stepchild, a father-in-law, mother-in-law, or in no other suitable housing accommodation in such building is available. So you are restricted if you have a tenant. It is a, you know, basically you're stuck. Um, and that's why we have to fight this because right now, that this what this will do is it will create perpetual tenancies. Right now you have the ability, um, and it was compromised with the HSTPA, but you have the ability still under RPL 226C to get rid of a, a tenant under 30, 60, or 90 days by just choosing not to non-renew them um, without right. a reason. Um, increasingly, tenants are challenging that with a reason by filing a New York State human rights law. Um, I've been flooded with those this year, I will tell you. Um, but you, you still have the right without giving a reason to get rid of a tenant just because you wanted to. This law will get rid of that. So... Um, there's only five, six, six isolated reasons, um, which again, I will go over in more detail because we're right up against, I know nine o'clock here, but it will right. be next Wednesday um, at two o'clock. If you're interested on the round table, um, we will be going over this potential bill. Jamie, is it correct that isn't good cause um, effective for four units or more? So if you have uh, one, two or three unit. I thought their proposal for good cause only applied to buildings with four units or more. Am I wrong um, on that? Yes, no, you're right. It's an owner-occupied premises with less than four units is accepted. Yep. So I don't know how big your properties are, Alex. That might be an out for you. Okay. No, most, most of our, um, my own personal portfolio is all single families and I have one three family, so. Um, you know, it's not, if that's the case, and it sounds like I can just terminate and move on with my life. But I do have clients that have uh, eight unit buildings, 11 unit buildings, um, where they would essentially be stuck with whatever this thing is. I mean, mm -hmm. as it stands right now, some of these, I have one building where they have 60% you know, of the people have just deliberately decided not to pay. Yeah, and keep in mind, again, they're trying to backdoor you in the money that is going to be potentially handed out by saying, if you accept these funds from the federal government on behalf of the tenant, you cannot evict for a year. That is good cause, as far as I'm concerned. That is a backdoor. We have to stop it now as part of the federal funding. It has no business in there. And, and I promise you, as part of the lawsuit that's pending or will be pending, that piece will be included. It will be a supplement to any action we already started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everybody's time. Absolutely. I think that that wraps us up with time. So thank you to our panel of guests who, who came in and spent the last couple hours with us. Um, I'm not even gonna bother bringing up the Oops networking room or anything. Um, I think everybody's beat after this, but uh, I will say follow us on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube and LinkedIn. Um, we're going to be posting the uh, video of tonight up to the website once we get it captioned. Uh, it'll probably be up on like Monday. It usually takes them three days to do something this long. Um, and then once that's up there uh, our, to our guests, you guys are more than welcome to get copies of that for your own chopping apart and using uh, as needed, if, if at all. Uh, and it will be behind the paywall at Freya. It will not be necessarily out for public consumption on YouTube, like the housing provider support and the uh, alternate, alternative real estate investing meetings are. Um, we thank you for that too, because not to interrupt you, Andy, but the, again, the more this stuff gets out that we're talking about, the less we get access to the legislature. So just so yeah. you guys understand. So Jamie, to your point uh, that you're making here, just a, a bit of follow on, we, we'll um, cut out some space in one of our meetings later here, so you'll have an opportunity to follow. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm always available whenever you guys need us. We uh, we appreciate the funding and we'll always come on here. Yeah, super.
thank you, everybody. I think that's it for tonight. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you. Uh, the next meeting is Alternative Real Estate Investing Strategies on the 18th at 7 p.m. Thank you, thank you guys. Appreciate guys. your time.